Anxiety is real, but do you know its source? In addition to my own experience dealing with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and anxiety for many years that ran my life, literally ran my life. I'm a clinician and researcher, and for the last 17 years, I have found that getting to the source of anxiety, where it's really coming from, understanding it, naming it, claiming it, helps us to be able to unra unravel the why and be able to get to the what. What are we feeling anxious about? Getting to an understanding helps the mind be able to find a ground. So once we know the sources of the different anxieties, the different causes that could be there, it's much easier to work with and essentially heal yourself. As a healer as well and medical intuitive, I find that all healing is really self-healing. I, I might be a guide on the side that's helping somebody be able to find that within themselves, but essentially all healing is self-healing. The professionals that I did and didn't see when I was younger and really dealing with the massive pressures of the OCD and feeling like the walls are crashing in on me a bit, I didn't have the skills and tools of what I needed. So it's my desire to share with you some things that took me a lot of years to figure out, and I'm hoping that it will be helpful. In this video, we're gonna go through my checklist of underlying causes, some underlying causes. Some are common, some are maybe less common to you. And what I believe to be a more appropriate definition of anxiety based on my and others' experiences rather than the conventional. I'm Tiffany Barsotti, a spiritual counselor and medical intuitive, a teacher and a guide on the side. Thank you for being present today and let's walk through this together. So first of all, a little disclaimer that this is not medical advice. Please, if you are dealing with something that is a, that is a known mental illness, especially if it's suicide, these are very serious things and please seek the help. This is, you know, we sometimes call it university YouTube. And while this can be helpful, it is not meant to replace any sort of medical guidance or advice. And I'm certainly not giving you any here. If this is meant to be informative uh, about what I experienced in my own journey and what I have found to be helpful for other people. So please see a qualified medical practitioner, mental health practitioner, anyone that you may need to support you if you are dealing with something very serious. Anxiety can be very serious. And I'm here to sort of unpack the things that are less discussed. So first of all, I wanna look at the definition of what we know to be the, the classical definition is a little different than my take and, and what I have found. As I said, anxiety is real, but the definition may need to be questioned. This definition comes from the APA, the American Psychological Association. Anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure or panic attacks, these kinds of things. People with anxiety disorders usually have recurring intrusive thoughts or concerns. My definition is that anxiety is not a single emotion. It's not an emotion unto itself. It's an accumulation of emotions and feelings that haven't been tended to, that haven't been processed, like experiences just doing a drive-by on you, but nevertheless landing landing on your heart, landing in your throat for the things that you couldn't say or wouldn't say, or for many reasons to feel safe in the world. But they are, the emotions are accumulated because there was an action that needed to be taken, but it may not have been appropriate in that time or safe for any of us to have taken that action or even have known what to do. Experience begets more experience and experience is our best teacher. There's a great saying, I don't know who to attribute credit. 
experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. <laughs> I think it's a, a great saying. So it's not your fault, but it is our responsibility. So now that anxiety is a reality, if it is in your life, it's something that we ultimately have to take responsibility for to shift it, to change it. It's not work that somebody else can do for us. People can certainly be helpful, but it's not a load that somebody else, a burden that somebody else can usually handle. It's, it's for us. It's our teacher, essentially. So because anxiety may not be exactly what you think it is or what your health practitioner or medical doctor or whomever may have even diagnosed you with anxiety, it, it would be wise to use this time together to review this checklist of the uncommon and common traits that we see and see if there's a resonance, see if there's something that strikes a chord with you. And hints, there's usually more than one. And that's because they've been layered. So the even more reason to get to understanding the source. So see if you recognize yourself in any of these descriptions. So the first one on, on my list is trauma. Trauma with or without post-traumatic stress. Trauma is something that could have happened from when we were very young. It gets stored in the unconscious. I use unconscious and subconscious synonymously they, to really mean the same thing. And I'm, I do a lot of work based on Jungian uh, psychology and depth psychology as part of my training. And this is, um, I really don't see a differentiation there. So traumas can be from birth. They can be from an experience from when we were very young. They can be at any time in life. And what might be a trauma to one person may not be to another. Some of us have thicker skin when it comes to being able to handle some even looking at a traumatic scene. Some people can keep their cookies down and some people can't. So these kinds of things it, it, with the trauma are, we need to refer to ourself. What feels traumatic? And a clue is that you are having recurring visions or recurring thoughts about what it is that you may have witnessed or gone through. And what trauma does is it creates a reaction and a response that embeds the emotions and beliefs that are experienced at that time as being reality, as being real. So the next time we're stressed, we may feel exactly those but not necessarily linking them together, exactly those same things that made a traumatic response in our body. And even though it could be a much lighter stress, the stress in stress, we all regress. And it can take us back to uh, something that had happened that makes those trauma responses. So each time we're in subsequent stressful or traumatic situations, our body minds can react as though we're experiencing that exact same core event all over again. It's an interesting phenomenon, but there's wisdom in it because what it allows us to do is be able to track it. And since we can track it, that's actually how we can heal it. Let me give you a little clinical pearl here. The subconscious will never ever bring anything to the surface of our awareness that we can't handle, never. The prime directive of the subconscious is to keep us alive, safe, and healthy. So when we have a memory or something come up, it's because we can handle it. We may not think so, and that's what turns things into anxiety because we think we can't handle it. And so therefore it doesn't get processed and things just continue to do a drive-by. That's a slippery slope. So carrying on. Number two on my list is worry. Now there's a few different components of worry. First of all, in stress, stress is caused by looking too far ahead or paying attention too much to what's in the past. So we have, when worry comes up, we can interview ourselves. What am I worried about? Is, am I thinking in the future or am I thinking in the past? Because neither one we can do anything about. They are beyond our control. This moment now is the only one that we have. So let's not waste it on worrying about what isn't in our ability to do anything about right now. Now, 
I, I have a in the, the tool list, I've got a, a toolkit and, and a whole bunch of goodies that are available to you uh, after you do go through this checklist. It's available on my website. But suffice it to say, I just want to give a little pearl of some threads of things that might be able to be easy for you to assimilate and start to work with like they were for me. But like I said, it took me a long time to put all these details together. The deal with, with it, when worry comes up is we want to ground ourselves in the now. You know, Eckhart Tolle, God bless his soul, love him as a teacher. Um, the frustration I have with him, to be totally honest, is he just says, be in the now, but doesn't often give a how. And just a, a very quick hack right now is look at your feet. Your feet are always in the present moment, and it can create an interrupt of the worry, like a runaway train. So we'll be talking about that again. And then you ask yourself the question, what do I have control over right now? You have control over what you put in your mouth. You have control over what you go do next. You have control ultimately over what it is that you're thinking. It may not feel like it, but you do. So stay strong. Number three. Empathic or codependent habits. So this is a biggie because I, I'm a recovering codependent. I am also an empath, but I have trained myself to not be overly sensitive to the extent that I am bombarded by everybody else's feelings. We must start to turn on discernment. As empaths, our number one skill is to use discernment. Is this feeling mine? or is it somebody else's? This can begin a self-questioning where you can start to really unpack what is relevant for you in that moment. There's all kinds of um, nuances that I would love to go into, but I, I'm just trying to get through the checklist right now. Empaths tend to be outwardly focused as in they're looking to be sourced from the outside rather than being sourced from the inside. And so that can create codependent habits because we habitually look for how it is that we can find our happiness and well being and stability depending on how other people behave. Woo, that's another slippery slope, too. So, oftentimes in that habit, we're looking to see is everybody else okay? Because if they're okay, then I'm okay. No, self responsibility. That's actually on the list as well. So, we're going to get there. But number one for empathic habits and codependent habits is to have discernment. Be aware of what's yours. There's much more that's on the checklist as well, as far as information. But I'm going to keep going through this list. So number four, avoidance. Woo, this is a biggie. So the root cause ultimately is in fear, fear of doing something wrong or not getting it right, and perfectionism. So we put off making decisions or we procrastinate, or we avoid confrontations, or we don't have those crucial conversations that we know that we need to have. Anxiety is actually a mobilizing energy. Anxiety is like a, um, see it as a fast moving river that wants to, to move through us. It's telling us that there's energy, there's creative energy to do something with. And if we haven't, if we've been damming it up because it hasn't had a chance to move, Man, this can, it can block so much good. And there's more things related to this on the list, but the aversion to doing the next thing, the avoidance of planning. Some people see plan, P-L-A-N, as a four letter word, like, you know, what? You know, they just think, oh, I, I will let the universe tell me what's next. That's not exactly you being in the driver's seat. The universe responds to our emotions as well to help us create. And our emotions are a huge component. It's like the, it's the fuel to the car. And if we're driving our vehicle, we are the, gonna be the ones that either need to put our foot on the gas pedal and appropriately take it off. That's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems. So and we can have a whole other discussion about the vagus nerve, which is where some of my research lay as well. But the, the point is for this avoidance pattern is to take any small action you can. You can. There's a, a great saying that um, you just iterate. You just continue to iterate. There's no perfection needed because we're all a work in progress. There's no there. 
we're, we're a work in progress. It's going to be this way. So meaning that it's going to be this way that there will always be a new height to get to. But if we stay in an avoidant and, and a, an aversion pattern, we are increasing in anxiety. That river is not going to stop. Could you imagine if you just tell your body, stop making blood? And some people have in their immune system. There are people who have allowed stress to actually take them to a place where it turns into autoimmune issues. It turns into opportunistic viruses or, or things that, that can take over the body. So that's the body-mind connection. So let that be a word to the wise. Let's use this creative river. Pay attention to it. Notice when you're avoiding and take any little action you can. Okay, number five on the list, lack of trust. So the root cause in lack of trust is ultimately a lack of self-trust and knowledge and trust with our own wise inner child. Our inner child is a very creative being. It seeks to play. And there's a whole, I'm, I don't know. So if you don't already have a relationship with your inner child, that can at least start to prime the pumps for you starting to create one. It's such an important piece. It has been a huge part of my healing journey and to unlock the mystery of where the OCD and all of that was stemming from and why it was holding me hostage in my life. So really can't stress this enough. Self-trust actually begins with our inner child. And this is just take that at face value, there's work to do there, but there's only so much that we can do as we're going through this list. Between the ages of 18 months and two years, we're actually learning whether or not we can trust people in our lives. And that's uh, Eric Erickson's work. And um, a clinical psychologist in, uh, did a lot of work in hypnosis. He looked at childhood development patterns. I look at that a lot. It is very, very helpful, whether you're a parent raising children to pay attention to that or looking at your own timeline of life and seeing when things, key things happen to you that have created stress and trauma. So as, as adults, our first relationship is with that inner child, but we need to cultivate it. So that ultimately is what helps to build self-trust. So check out more on the website for those kind of um, in those details. And it's a lot more about also becoming more insourced and once again, not looking to the outside world. Okay, number six, creativity. Blocked or not pursued. This is also dealing, looking at anxiety like a fast moving river that wants to move. And depression is actually on the other side of that. Depression is the dam. And it's where all that fast moving energy is running into. And it doesn't have anywhere to go because we've got, we have the, our, our foot on the brake. We're deciding to avoid or block our creativity or saying not now to those creative impulses that we have. This is something so important and it is so within our ability to say yes, to say yes to our creative nature. We're all creators. This is, I'm not talking about being an artiste or, or anything highfalutin that has to do with being a creator, like it, you know, there's a certain archetype to it. No, by being alive, we're all creators. We're creating our reality all the time. It just might be the same damn reality. <laughs> Okay, so this one is about not violating our inspirations. So we really want to pay attention to those inspirations. So just notice, are there a lot of creative projects or things that you've wanted to get to that you haven't given time to? And that can build anxiety. So it's a biggie. Number seven, unprocessed emotions. As I was saying earlier, that in the definition, of anxiety, my definition of anxiety is anxiety is a whole bunch of emotions. It's not a singular emotion. And so you could have despair and grief and sadness, and um, you could have a broken heart. You could have excitement. You could have anger. You can, uh, the whole gamut of emotions. By the way, I love Brene Brown's new book. I think it's uh, The Heart of the Atlas, where she's discussing, I think it's 85 different emotions. I totally agree. I see a whole span and a continuum. 
And there's feelings and emotions are a little bit different, what we feel and the emotion that ultimately gets stored and then makes a pattern in the brain. Fascinating information. And we, with our neuroplasticity, with our choices, have the ability to repattern. So these unprocessed emotions are these experiences that have just done a drive-by and didn't get processed. So when, once again, when the subconscious brings something to the level of our awareness, even if it's in a dream state, that's for us to work with in the next day, in the next morning, or wake up right then and, and work with it. Sometimes it's, it's really difficult to go back to sleep after there's been something that really has been um, experiential in, in that time of our, our nighttime or daytime. I mean, there are people that also have hypnagogic or hypnopompic um, times where before you go to sleep and after when you start to wake up, there's different ways that the bat, that the brain is actually giving you information about a question that you may have put forth and also what needs resolving. So that's really important. Those unprocessed emotions are actually looking to be resolved. And remember, the subconscious mind will never give you anything that you cannot handle. It's, it's the prime directive. And if you don't trust me, check in with your own inner physician and your own self and figure that out on your own. It's hugely important. Okay, we wanna stop the wheel of madness. So let's process these emotions so that we're not handing it down to the next generation. Number eight, inner guidance avoidance. Uh, what this is kind of goes hand in hand with resisting creative urges and inspiration. But this is a little bit of a nuance. It's different because inner people are maybe negotiating. I did when I was dealing with the OCD stuff. Man, it, it, my ego was running the show. I had to tease out the difference between what was intuition, what was ego, what was fear, what was anger, what was all mixed up that created this nutty response in my, in my body. And it, it was a nightmare. And I, I really am very compassionate and empathetic for people that are going through that. I know there's a way out. You can rewire your nervous system. I am proof of the pudding that it is possible. It is doable. Inner guidance avoidance is a big one here because we need to be paying attention to what it is that that, is that little kernel of insight. But if we got programmed either by our religions or by our um, parents or society or whatever, there's a lot of programs that are coming in from the outside world. You know, I... I, I I like to have a use a hashtag called believe yourself. And that's really important. We want to ultimately believe ourselves. And this conf this takes confidence. And for us to really trust that inner voice, all of us have an inner voice. And if you don't feel that you immediately have it, then this is some homework. This is some, some uh, cultivation that can be had because it goes hand in hand with pretty much everything that we've been talking about because anxiety is the common theme to the, outso the, the outcome of all of these things not being realized or processed. And our inner guidance is just, wow, I, I actually wouldn't be alive here today. Absolutely can say that if I had violated my inner guidance so many times in my life. I am grateful for that. And my urge is, is that you find it for yourself. And I bring up religion because this comes up quite a bit. I'm a mass, I have a master's in theology. And I jokingly say that I am a theologian with no dogma. I, spirituality is our own relationship with ourself. It's nobody else's business. What goes on in the inner workings uh, between our heart our mind and all of our connecting, our vertical connection to our higher forces. And we do wanna stay grounded, that is key. Okay, moving on. Number nine, so hyper responsibility. This is interesting. I had this as a kid. It means that, and this also degrades into codependency as well. If we think that our safety in the world is dependent on controlling all of the conditions and being responsible for everything and everyone in our environment, 
that is going to degrade into codependency and probably many other things as well. And like I said, I'm a recovering codependent. I have to work on this all the time. So, and there, there's a, a great saying by one of my teachers, what saved us as a child will kill us as an adult. And it, that was Paul Brenner, my beloved, he was an MD, PhD, and just did amazing work in the world. And he's retired now, but what a gift. Anyway, I, I, I would like to soften that a little bit because it may not kill you, but it'll cause a lot of misery on the way to killing you. So however we behaved as a child was a, a coping mechanism. It, it helped us to be able to cope. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it is wise for us to continue taking hyper responsibility for everything else that goes on. So you can you can see how um, there's some nuances here to other things that I have mentioned earlier. Okay, so moving on to number ten: repetitive and recurring thoughts. These need uh, di some dissection. So what I inform or what I have done myself and what I've asked my clients to do is to keep a list of what the recurring thoughts are, what are the recurring feelings, what are the, the intrusive, um, inopportunistic, they usually come up when it's just, wow. You know, it, it's, they're opportunistic. So make a little note because we won't always need to, we won't always get to prioritize looking at it and healing it and really processing it oftentimes while it's happening, but there's a clue, there's gems in there for us to be able to work with. So these, these thoughts can, they can be crazy making and, but they're doing you a favor because once again, the subconscious mind is not going to bring anything to the level of our awareness that we cannot handle. So please rest on that as a, uh, a truth, a truism, and work with it. So these repetitive thoughts are asking you to look at something that happened in that moment in time that you may not have been able to act upon, but if you were in it again, what would you do differently? And time is not linear, especially when it comes to healing in the body-mind, right? I mean, we can remember things from we, when at early ages, or we remember nothing. <laughs> it's just, it's a whole gamut of things, but it's, it, it's an interesting thing. It's not like in order to think of a thought of when you were five years old, you have to go through the whole chronology of your life in order to get to five. No, it's a nonlinear process. So things will just come up to the surface as needed. So pay attention to those because there's great, great wisdom. And the more we do that, the less ch chances of us getting hit by the proverbial spiritual two by four, like what happened to me when I was living across the street from ground zero when they were cleaning up the buildings. My, my story is, is on the website or I think there's another video in, in this channel. So anyway, um, moving on to number 11, biochemical imbalances, foods, medicines, heavy metals, a vata, body or mind type, that's a dosha in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, Tibetan medicine also has a similar type, type of uh, typology for people. So biomedical imbalances can be the result of over supplementing for, you know, trying to do something yourself, or if you know that you've got a, a genetic propensity to not um, clear some neurotransmitters or clear out uh, toxins or things like that. It can create multiple sensitivities and allergies and, and it can also adjust our microbiome. These kinds of things can cause anxiety as well. So we wanna pay attention to if you are, and also foods, some foods. I know I can't, as much as probably most of us like chocolate, I can't have it after three o'clock. I, I, there's a, a period in time in my day that I can have it, but if I have it after three, I get an, an anxious rush, even really good high quality chocolate, which I highly recommend that <laughs> we all have every once in a while. So many people are not really aware of their constitution or their innate sensitivities and that keeping a food journal, it would be a good way to, or a supplement journal for what you're doing and what you're noticing. 
So we could be doing this to ourselves by some supplements that we're taking. People who are GABA sensitive or um, thyrosine or different things. Once again, I'm not a medical doctor. I do have a good friend who has a wonderful website who teaches about how to access your own inner physician. And, you know, I, I don't know about you. I've been very misled on the medical journey for my own healing path and really had to go inward myself and figure it out. And that's actually what took me to graduate seminary and studying with Norm Sheely and, and Carolyn Mace and uh, Christine Page and Karen Kramask. I mean, there are so many people, Marsha Emery, people that I got to study with that are just incredible. So Christiane Northrup, um, I, I feel great fortune that I got to study directly with these amazing minds and hearts. And Jess Petrus is very available. Um, her website is just uh, drjess.com and she can help with, with that and give you a lot of um, satisfaction with asking certain questions where you may not have been getting the answers that you've been seeking. So we wanna think a little bit complementary, not necessarily alternative, because I, I believe in integration. I believe in and both. And I, I believe that complementary is definitely the way to go. So, all right, moving on to number 12. Manipulations, subtle or overt. Manipulations, ultimately it's lacking boundaries. And this means where we are doing the manipulating, or we are being manipulated. So got to turn on that inner lens of your vision to be able to really see what the heck is happening. So this is the drama triangle. I have a lot of resources about this on my website. The drama triangle is victim, rescuer, persecutor. Victim, rescuer, persecutor. Once you're on this dang thing, man, it is a, um, a very seductive loop. And we all learned it from early on in our life. We learned it in being in, with, in society. We've learned it from our politics. We've learned it. It's just everywhere. Once you start to see how this works, you can really see it's everywhere. And it takes a lot of discernment and a lot of clarity to stay off the drama triangle. So there's a, a course that I will be offering. Um, I do offer from time to time. So just look on my website and um, sign up on the wait list if that's something that you are finding resonance with. Um, essentially, we are manipulating other people or other people are manipulating us when we are on this drama triangle. And figuring out these subtleties is super important for our freedom. I, I cannot emphasize that enough. So it's something to be aware of. There's a lot of resources, like I said, on this channel and also uh, on my website, Heal and Thrive. Okay, number 13, phobias. Root cause, belief that something is wrong with me. Phobias are usually a learned behavior. Interesting. And they can be traced back to early childhood. They can stem from an event that your parents may have had or something else that you may have observed. Um, there's a I had a client once whose parents, the, the, the mom was deathly afraid of spiders and the child ended up creating a whole phobia because her, she watched her mom just like go, go into a complete frozen state until the dad or somebody else in the household went and got the vacuum and sucked it up. So now at the sight of a spider for that child and, and into adulthood, that wasn't her reality necessarily it was something that she observed, but she absorbed as a real threat and fear. So we have to question where these phobias really come from. And also whether or not you believe in past lives, we have been on a uh, earth recycling program for five, close to 5 billion years. So we've got some stuff of where we come from and those phobias can be handed down. So it's, it's an interesting thing. There's information about that on, on the website as well. So. Pay attention to that and just see where, where the behaviors may have come from if that is something that you deal with. And you may have to work with a professional uh, in order to help with that. I have found neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, to be very helpful. Just work with a qualified person to help get that unpatterned for you. Okay, number 14, speaking of transgenerational. Transgenerational, how things get handed down. Man, there was a beautiful study done several years ago at the uh, Emory University, and they looked at, at mice 
who were given a scent. And the, the scent was during their whole time of development and it was fine, no big deal. Well, then later on in these mice life, they started introducing shocks at the same time of giving the scent for, I think it was five generations. It's been a while since I looked at the study, but I think it was five generations. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd have to look at it again, but, but several generations, the pups from those mice, if that scent was wafted in the air, the mice shuddered and they were the ones, they're pups. They weren't the ones exposed to it. Their parents were, or to, actually it was just even one, the, the uh, father was, I think that's the way it went. Sorry, anyway, don't, don't quote me on that. Go find that study. Actually, I have it on my website as well when I speak about philosophy, but it's interesting because it really speaks to uh, the, the transgenerational hand downs of things that did not get healed by the people in our family before. So please, a call to the wise for parents out there. Let's do our own work so that we don't have to hand it to our pups, to our children so that they, they've got their own contracts. They've got their own things to do. They don't need to be healing our stuff for us. So free them, do your own work, and let our ancestral river be what it is, but it doesn't have to have a grave effect on us because we have awareness to it and we know what thing, where things are coming from. So there's lots of things that we can do about that that's Googleable or internet searchable. Um, and biggest thing about this that I want to say is one of my main goals in the world is to help end human suffering. And we want to end the, the karmic wheel. I want to end the karmic wheel. I don't want to keep creating the same stuff over and over again. It's time for us to creatively move along on our dharmic path. Dharma means the direction of life that actually gives us life. So it's a, it's a real gift when we can do that and not be living the things of the past. So let's, let's work together to help end this karmic wheel and not repeat history. Next is number 15, situational anxiety. Social anxiety, fear of missing out, perfectionism, bullying, confrontation, overwhelm. These are situational uh, instances where we can see or we can have, especially for a person that's more introverted, that processes things more inside than outward. Extroverts process as they speak usually. And so there's a difference in how it is that we move through the world based on how it is that we represent ourselves introvertedly or extrovertedly. So the, the thing about this is to be aware of what is actually causing it and where it is of, of things that are, are going on and they can set up our patterns. So the first thing to begin to start changing it is just to observe yourself. When do these things come up? So it's, it's just another um, avenue for where anxiety gets to travel in our lives. So, but it's an opportunity for healing. Number 16, infantilization and adulting or lack of adulting, I should say. It, it's, we call it adulting, right? Like when somebody has a difficult time adulting. So this is resistance to taking on responsibilities. So you, can you see how this drama triangle would work out? It would be a rescuer's job to take on the responsibility of somebody that would be in the victim role of needing to be taken care of. So it's a back and forth thing, but it's done out of an unhealthy relationship. So this infantilizing thing means that it's really detrimental because it means that we actually may not have had the appropriate boundaries. We didn't have the things uh, the, the proper boundaries when we were younger growing up or a sense of entitlement or things like that, where everything is done for you and is it, the, a person, a child or an adult didn't really learn the, the rules, the governance of self-responsibility. And there's an eternal child archetype that also could be 
playing out here, eternal child. It's like the Peter Pan syndrome, the person that just doesn't want to grow up and take responsibility for themselves and their lives. So anyway, there, there's more information about this in the checklist. When you go to the website, you can see about that. But just see, notice for yourself if that you are in that role or you know other people in that role. Because even if you're an empath or a person that is even around people are like that, man, this can be super zapping of energy. It's like a, an energy vampire. And it, it's something to have awareness of and for you to also have a clear boundary. I had to go through a lot of that myself personally and still do. I, it's a constant management. We're alive, right? It's, our, our lives take management. Okay, number 17, fear of the future. Mind racing. The mind races to predict what is gonna happen in the future. It, the root cause is once again, lack of trust, faith in ourself, or and or the need to control everything and everyone or the environments or the conditions. By the way, the drama triangle is also the blame game and the control game. So you can see the dynamics of how all of this works out. So fear of the future though causes this, it's another component of avoidance or an aversion to taking the next step. I have worked with a few people in my practice who are agor agoraphobic, which means that they have a fear of going outside. And we just have to find where is that original phobia? Where did it get laid down? And it's usually early on in life. They feel safer in an environment that they can control. We all do. That, that's just human nature, of course. But when we notice that there's anxiety caused by the fact that we are not taking even a, a, a small step of what we can because we have a fear of making a mistake, then we really need to restore faith in ourselves because it's not about anybody else, but it is about us. Okay, moving on, number 18. Ah, diagnosis. This is really, really important. I work with a lot of people who have had recurring illnesses, chronic illnesses, cancers, et cetera. And the biggest fear that I have run into in that regard is there, there's a fear of being re-diagnosed or like anxiety about what if it comes back. And it's a very looming anxiety, anxiety provoking feeling also about being out of control, fear of the future, fear of what the future brings, right? So when we think about the word diagnosis, and I, I've taught this in, in instances where I'm um, doing integrative talks with some colleagues. And it's interesting because this really isn't taught in Western medicine schooling, but the root word of diagnosis is a Latin dia, D, if we take it apart for the etymology, DIA means to separate or to take apart. And gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S -S, is wisdom. So if we stop in that moment and we separate the information that we're getting and we use our own wisdom, we want to come out of the orb of the hypnosis of whenever that diagnostic was given because it puts us into a fear state. The fear state creates a neutrality in the brain and it means that anything that anybody says becomes programmable. And so oftentimes I call it screensaver mode. A person will receive some news and there are many doctors that don't have great bedside manners when it comes time to delivering really important information. And this is a big one. What will happen is the screensaver mode will happen and it's a hypnotic effect. And everything else, like this world just changes. It goes into slow motion, it, it's shock. And, but now you're not using your ability to separate yourself in that instance because we're in a state of shock when some, something has happened. And it's like, because the brain goes into neutral. So when we think about diagnosis, what you want to think about is your own innate wisdom. What do you know? And I, I just also want to say, I strongly believe and find evidence for in my life and with all the people with whom I've worked, that everything happens in our life to benefit us. And it may not look like it or feel like it, but 
really illness has been my best teacher and it's everybody else's best teacher if they can find it. So, and that's really the point of it is, is to get the lesson. What is it that was intended because the illness or sickness or disease or whatever didn't happen to us. It happened for us. We are in the driver's seat. And if we think that it happened to us, then it means that we're in the victim seat. And that feels so disempowered. And uh, stay in the gnosis, stay in the own, in your own inner wisdom. You have your own innate answers. You really do. And I'm, I'm here to be a guide on the side to help you find them if that has lost its restoration, if that needs to be restored with you as well. So number 19, we're getting towards the end here. Living in the past or the future, this harkens to some other things I was saying about fear of what the future brings, et cetera. But what, there's a tool I wanna share with you right now, which is it's essentially what's happening in that, as I said, stress is a runaway train of the future or it's a being hung up in things of the past. So interrupting that pattern of thought where it's like a runaway train Ultimately, we've got to get back to the moment of now to eliminate that disruptive and repetitive and negative thinking. So if a person, and this is it's just a little different than when we've got a repetitive thought because there's something coming up to the surface, living a person who lives in the past or lives in the future is not in the ability of being able to be in the driver's seat right now. So that's, that is a real need to recognize the difference and see what is preventing. Is it perfectionism? Is it something else on this list that we've also covered? So um, the tool is to once again, stop, look at your feet. Right now, everything is fine. Usually 98% of the time, maybe more. Usually we're just fine. I like to say, then go to the basics. Okay, I have food in the refrigerator. I have what I need right now. I'm okay right now. And if you're not, you're not in a, in a okay right now, then work to get yourself to that place. So this, once again, it's not meant to be medical advice because if you're in a really harried situation, please get help. But you're probably not watching this video <laughs> if that's the case. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, 20. Uh, Self-doubt, not knowing your purpose or passion for being here on planet Earth. This is really anxiety provoking. I know there's something for me to do, but I just don't know what it is. Well, it's true. There, I, I believe that we are all here for some reason. And I can tell you, this is tied to the very last one that we're going to be speaking to as well. The biggest wounds, the biggest teachers in my life have been absolutely related to my gifts and my purpose and my passion. My story as a reluctant healer is on my website. You can watch it. I also am on Gaia TV. I told pretty much my whole story there. And it's about how I rewired my nervous system uh, for to get rid of anxiety, to get rid of OCD. And this is something that is so capable of being revealed. But many of us keep blasting ourselves with the wound of what we experienced and not necessarily seeing the gift. Our job, our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to find what that gift really is. And sometimes we may have to go deep to find it. But we all have a purpose. We all have something that we are here to do, to be, to experience, to offer as a gift. And many people are waking up these days to wanting to be of service and help to others. So if that's you, then let's get to work on it. This, these are, there's a lot that's out on the, the net, the internet to be able to help find your passions. There's something I do called esoteric numerology that can help. It looks at the soul number, the birth number, the path that we're here to walk, the life lessons, those kinds of things. And it also looks at cycles. I have another video on that for, for that topic, but it, there are ways of finding these things out to do self-inquiry, even astrology. Astrology is a beautiful way of starting to access that. If that's not within your cosmology, then find something within your belief system, then find something that is. Because that, that is a very anxiety-provoking 
uh, place to be to feel like there's something I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't have access to it. And I'm here to tell you, you do have access to it. And there's little breadcrumbs that just need to be picked up along the way. I have a great saying that I came up with, I'm proud of it, that if we follow the breadcrumbs, we end up being well-fed. So in, in all way, shape and form. So take that in. Number 21, the, the last one on my list. And if you have more to add to my list that didn't get covered here, or you felt like it wasn't addressed, please leave me a comment. And I wanna know, I wanna know what's, what did I leave off and let's discuss it and let's find a solution. Okay, fear of discovering our wounds. So this is related to what I was just saying. So there are some people when I say, hey, well, what was the worst pain you've ever been in in your life? Because that's what, that vortex down it's like when an addict hits, hits rock bottom, that's when they can really make a difference to get well. They, it it's oftentimes takes us being able to hit because we live in a polar universe. There's contrast that's needed to these experiences so that we can actually challenge our, ourselves to be able to find that core gift. So, but sometimes people have a fear of going there. And this is also anxiety producing. So it's the hero's journey or heroine's journey. This is so important to realize because everyone has a zone of genius. And it really may be like a treasure chest in the bottom of the ocean that we have to go to the deeps to be able to find and access and open and be able to reap the rewards. So that's it on the checklist. Uh, like I said, please add more. And think about what anxiety is costing you. It almost cost me my life. No joke. Really, no joke. And for people who are in that position, I have great compassion and empathy for being where you are. And it's all changeable. I am living proof. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to use this checklist. It's, on, it's available on my website. I'll put a link into the um, into this area where the comments are, to use this checklist to increase the activity of knowing yourself, healing yourself, and freeing yourself. Funny, that's my tagline. <laughs> heal and thrive. Know thyself, heal thyself, free thyself. Truly, nobody else can do it for us. We are the ones. We have to do it. I mean, hopefully you choose that you are the one to do it because other people can't really carry it or do it for us. So please don't leave your, your own internal work to the next generation and allow yourself to be that archeologist that goes deep, that finds what you need to in order to polish the gold, to get to those nuggets. You know, the, the saying is, is that you don't get a lotus flower without the mud. And boy, that is very true. It's been true and evident in many factions of my life. So you got this. We all got this if we choose it. Thank you. I am Tiffany Barsotti. I'm a teacher and guide on the side. And I am grateful that you are here listening to this. And I hope that there's been some resonance. There, there's been something helpful for you to be able to use and utilize immediately in your life. And if, there, if there's something that you would like to see addressed or go deeper into, please leave a comment below. Subscribe if you like and download the checklist and start to put it to work and see, see what emerges for you. I wanna turn it over to you. What did strike a chord here? What did have resonance? I would love to hear and have that discussion in the comments. Really appreciate you going deep, being present here. I know it was a longer video and hopefully there's some gems that actually give back to you as well. All right, over and out for now. Much love.